seven growth hacking strategies for funded startups. In this video, I'm gonna run through seven strategies that you can apply to your funded SaaS startup to help it grow on its journey to profitability. I'm Matt Grace, Managing Director of Flying Donkey. Let's get into it. All right, before I jump into it, let's talk about what growth hacking is and how growth hacking works. Simply put, growth hacking is about growing your business through acquisition of clients and making them stick around for the long term. This will result in profitability and a successful business for you and your company. Growth is generally the buzzword thrown around, but really it's gonna break down into a few key steps. Firstly, you're gonna to have to work out what sort of target client you need to go after. You're then gonna to have to acquire and onboard this client onto your product. And the final stage is gonna be maintaining that client relationship into the future. By acquiring, growing, and keeping clients on your platform, your business will continually move forward, be self-sustaining and profitable. That's ultimately what every business wants. In this video, I'm gonna break down seven strategies for growth hacking. The you can try and apply to your funded SaaS startup. First strategy I'm gonna go through is creating an indispensable product. Initially, when a SaaS product goes to market, it's normally targeted at one or two key features and trying to do them exceptionally well. As the product grows, it adds on more and more features to try and appeal to a wider audience, as well as satisfy more requirements from their existing customers. In this growth phase of the platform, where more and more features are added, the product is gonna become more applicable to more customers. But it's key to make sure that the product you're offering is indispensable to all the clients you have and the target market you have in mind also is indispensable to these features. Building an indispensable product is really about finding the key challenges in your client's businesses and then addressing them in your software product. Being at the heart and soul of a business is always a good place to be because they build their business around your SaaS product. Migrating away or taking out of their business becomes too much of a challenge and therefore their product becomes indispensable. At the same time, trying to make a small barrier to entry to start on your SaaS product is a common place. So once you've got that indispensable product, Looking through the free trial offer is something that's pretty common. What I wanna have a quick look at here is how Slack built an indispensable product and how they looked at offering the free trial solution. Slack offered a product where there was no limited features. You simply logged in and you got all the features available in the Slack product, albeit reduced to a limited message size. This allowed Slack to land and expand and get into a number of clients. Once they got the product into their business and workflow, they realized that it was an indispensable product and changed the way their teams communicated. At this point, in order to keep history and a few other small features that Slack added later, Slack began charging funds. At this point, because they got an indispensable product, the growth trajectory here for Slack was enormous. As many people are aware, Slack eventually got acquired by Salesforce for many billions of dollars, and this is on the back of their growth strategy. Building that indispensable product, getting that product into a bunch of clients, and making sure that's a key part of their workflow. If their product wasn't indispensable or it didn't do the job very well, Slack wouldn't be where it is today. So the first growth hacking strategy is to make sure that you build an indispensable product. Strategy two, streamline the onboarding process. It's all good to go out and market and advertise and get leads to your website or even get them to sign up onto your product. But really what you need them to do is onboard in a frictionless way and get up and running on your application. Let's have a look at a few steps you can do to reduce the friction in your onboarding process and get that product to be a key part of your client's workflow. This will ultimately lead to great growth in your product. Reducing onboard friction. An easy one to do here is single sign. It's becoming more common across many platforms, but I still see it not done very well. Logging in with Google, Microsoft, or Facebook is becoming common practice. This takes away many steps in signing up, giving users a new email address and password, and they're simply getting into the product. While it's a small step, all these things add up to create a much better frictionless onboarding strategy. Checklists and wizards are also a really good thing on onboarding. By being able to lay out what the user is gonna to have to step through to get onto the platform, that you set an expectation up front on what they're gonna to need to do. A simple wizard layout here is really key, and again, it's becoming more common practice. But again, I see this on many platforms not being implemented very well. So simply put here, reducing the friction on onboarding is a key step to get those clients you've gone out and marketed to onto your platform. All right, another way to reduce friction on the onboarding is both welcome videos and chatbots. Both of these things do similar things, and what they're trying to do is give the user support and some sort of communication, make sure that if anything is at hand, they can reach out and get support at any time. A welcome email is really Really good to lay out what the product does, what the next steps they can do, and where they can go for help. And a chatbot and AI bot is really good at being able to answer those frequently asked questions. For most funded startups, employing a support team is gonna be something out of the realm of possibility because it's simply too expensive. By producing welcome emails or using a chatbot facility, you're able to offer that support that's needed to reduce the onboarding friction while at a much lower price point. Making the users feel like they're not alone on the onboarding journey is a really important step here. 
making sure they feel like they're supported and can reach out at any point to get past any issues they may encounter. While you may understand your onboarding journey, an end user may not, and that might just be enough to stop them getting onto your platform. Tool tips and product tours. Once a client has onboarded or is getting through that onboarding process, they're gonna to come to a point where they're gonna get dropped on a landing page. Inside products, this is normally a home page or a graph page or a dashboard page. And from this point, they're gonna to need to know what to do. Sometimes there's setup required in various SaaS products, and this user is just being dropped on a page and not sure what to do. This is where tool tips or product tours are really good. They're interactive, they're automated, and they can help the user get to their next steps. Simply popping up and saying, hi, if you go to this screen now and enter these values, you can keep going on your journey to get this product up and running. The real goal here is to show the client value inside the product as soon as possible. Finally, on streamlining your onboarding process, analytics and data is really gonna be your friend here. Tracking all the signups and all the onboarding journeys is critical. Let's use an example here. Let's say you have a seven step onboarding process. Your analytics is showing you that a lot of people are dropping off at step three. You can see that something's wrong there. You can then go and investigate step three and see what's happening, whether it's too challenging, too hard, the screen's not working, or why people are dropping off at this point. You can then alter and change the screen to work in a more streamlined way or remove it altogether if it can be done at a later point. But without the data and analytics, you're not gonna know that, that screen might be the issue. And this is really, really key. Data analytics are critical for not only onboarding, but in this example, it can show how key it can be in catching that error point and then going in and fixing it. It's probably a very simple fix, but if you don't know it's there, it's really hard to fix. All right, strategy number three, contact marketing. Contact marketing is really a must these days. That's about getting you out there in front of your audience, presenting valuable content, and making you an expert in your niche. You've got to think at how many people are going to find you. And that's generally going to be through keyword searching. Google loves content. And if you're putting content out there that matches keywords that are for your audience, people are going to find your article. Once they find your article, they're obviously looking for a solution. And if you're writing articles about the solutions that your product solves, this is where you're going to get a huge growth channel. Content is really good at also pitching new features. If you release a new feature for your product, Putting content out about there that how it helps solve problems and how it's helped save time would be a really good feature to put into content. People might be searching for this, they can come across it and see how you've solved it for them. While advertising still does work into some capacity, content is king these days and really putting out a content marketing strategy to support your business is one of the tried and true methods of growth hacking for funded startups. Strategy number four, email marketing. Email marketing is another tried and true method that does actually work. Again, it's not gonna get your results straight away, but putting a great email marketing campaign in place is really gonna give you dividends over the long term. Email marketing combined with the analytics is really where the value is gonna be. If we go back to our onboard example previously, we can actually set up a flow where if people are dropping out at option three in the onboarding flow, and it's still a required flow, we might put them into an email funnel. We might be then saying, hi, you've dropped out of the fault step three, are you experiencing any issues? Or you can send them some frequently asked questions at that stage, or you can offer to simply reach out and talk to a support agent. At the same time, an email marketing strategy coupled with your content strategy is really gonna give you big dividends. By emailing out your content pieces and keeping people in the loop, they're gonna know what's going on on your platform. They may have potentially tried to use your platform in the past, but it really wasn't the right fit. But now you've added a new feature. If you didn't email them this piece of content, and then they read the piece of content, they wouldn't know that it was there. Once they know it's there, they'll potentially go back and sign up and there's a new client acquired for your product. Emailing is really about communicating with the client and making sure you're still getting into your inbox. Email is ubiquitous as it's ever been and it's the best way to reach your clients. Email marketing is a great growth hacking strategy. Strategy number five, retargeting. So this one is really about retargeting clients who have been to your website and left and not completed signups. They've either shown interest in some of your static content pages or they've partway through the onboarding journey and they've simply left your site. Retargeting is about tracking these users and then re-advertising to them on other pages to try and get them back and see what's going on. Retargeting works in order to get users back to your site, but at the same time, as we mentioned earlier, if there is an issue in one of your flows, you've got to make sure they don't keep hitting it when they come back. Retargeting is really effective because obviously that user has already shown interest in your product. That means there is some sort of fit there. Now, for some reason, they've obviously left and been unable to continue, and that may be just a time or a place thing, or it could be something wrong with your product. Retargeting really enables you to go back to those users who previously were interested in your product and left for some reason. Growth strategy number six, supplementing your team. As you start getting product fit within the marketplace, you're gonna find that your resources across the business are gonna be stretched. This will both be in your support area, development, and other areas in the business. Supplementing your business to bring in those professionals in those key areas at the right time can really help you get over those humps and bumps. I'll give you an example of where we help clients significantly. They've got a product market fit, and they're getting out there, and they're getting clients onto their platform. There's clients who are approaching them and saying, we love the product, 
but we just need these one or two features in order to make it work for us. The SaaS products look at their roadmap and they see that they've got so many items already lined up to develop and they simply can't get to them. They can either go back to the client and say, we'll deliver those products in six to 12 months, or they can say, we'll deliver those products in one to two months. They can either say to their client, sorry, we don't have the resources to deliver those for six to 12 months. At that point, the client is potentially gonna say, well, we are looking at options and we might go there and you're gonna lose the sale. Alternatively, turn to a company like Flying Donkey who can come in and supplement your development team. You can turn around to your client and say you'll deliver that product within one to two months. Striking while the iron is hot is really important in a SaaS product. There are so many SaaS products out there on the market and supplementing your team to give you the edge is one of the key great strategies we've seen work for a number of our clients. Flying Donkey partners with a number of businesses in helping them achieve these goals. So if you want to implement this great strategy in your business, feel free to reach out and I'm happy to have a chat. A seventh and final growth hacking strategy is around analyzing and collecting data. I did touch up on this one earlier, but really this one is a whole point on its own. It's very important in a SaaS product that you're collecting as much data as you can, because without the data, you can't analyze what's going on and how to improve. As I mentioned earlier in my onboarding example, you could see that people are signing up and leaving at a certain point, but it goes further than that. Inside your product, once users are using your features heavily, you may see that they are struggling to use them or not getting the output they need. Maybe the feature is there, but not quite there, or maybe the feature needs just something else to get them across the line. If you're running blind with no data to look at, it's gonna be very hard to analyze and fix those features. Generally speaking, clients are going to be a little lazy and they're not really gonna reach out and tell you exactly what's wrong with your product. But if you're tracking these features and you can proactively reach out to them and say, it looks like you've had a problem here, can you let me know some more detail? You're much better to get feedback on these items. Some of these fixes are sometimes really easy and quick, and they can be quick wins, not just for that client, but potentially for others. But without having the data to analyze in the first step, it's gonna make it near impossible for you to know what's going on. At the same time, the best time to start collecting data is today, because the more data you can collect, the more trends you can plot, and if you start later, you have less data to go off. Analyzing and checking your data on how your product is being used is one of my key tips on how to grow your SaaS product, and it summarizes up what the best things to do are here for growing your SaaS product. All right, that's seven growth tips for growing your SaaS startup. I hope they've been helpful for you. If you have any questions on any of these tips, or you have some other questions on growing your SaaS product, feel free to reach out here at Flying Donkey, where we can help you take your SaaS products to the next level.